Content warning. This podcast discusses violence, murder, suicide, civil unrest, aggressive policing, racism, and lynching. If you or anyone you know is considering suicide or self-harm or just need to talk about problems, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255 or text the Crisis Text Line at 741-741. Previously, on After the Uprising. I called 911 and all I remember screaming is my baby. It didn't look right, so, you know, he said, let's take pictures. All signs right off the bat pointed that this was a suicide. We know what the facts of the case are. We know what detectives are investigating and what they saw. I would get messages. The one that really stuck out was, you're not hard to get. I was, We was right behind you at the rally. What? Okay, why the fuck are you grabbing her like an animal? They feel like we don't appreciate law enforcement here. Therefore, it has an adverse effect of certain cops not being as diligent when it comes to straight up and down police work. I just know that the one detective that the one with the black eye did not give us his business card, gave us a card for uh, the airport police. What you're looking at is the aftermath of the grand jury deciding not to indict Officer Wilson. A young man found hanging from a tree in October. His mom believes someone murdered her son, targeting him. Danye became an activist in the wake of the shooting death of Michael Brown by a white police officer. That's why Melissa McKinnis wants St. Louis County Police to dig deeper into her son's death. He was not suicidal. This is After the Uprising, the death of Donye Dion Jones. New developments about a deadly discovery in St. Louis County. A young man found hanging from a tree in October. His mom believes someone murdered her son, targeting him because she was a Ferguson protester. Jacob Long is here with the medical examiner's final report. Jacob? Well, Mike and Ann, the report we're talking about tonight, it is 15 pages long, and the medical examiner's conclusion is pretty clear. After reviewing the evidence, she says Donye Jones died of suicide by hanging. When the St. Louis County Medical Examiner's Office released their final report on Donye's death, some local media again briefly focused on Donye's story. But they were mostly uncritical of what they were provided by county. According to this report from the medical examiner, an investigator found a chair under that tree. And while Jones did not leave a suicide note, his family says he often talked about being depressed. Meantime, Jones' family is disputing the report. His mom told us a few months ago that her son was targeted and she believes murdered. She says he did not know how to tie the kind of knot that was used in the hanging. And she said he was upbeat and not acting suicidal. The St. Louis County Police Department, which also ruled this a suicide, says the investigation remains open until detectives can review the cause of death. Medical examiner's office, this is Suzanne. Hi, I submitted a sunshine request and I got the uh, paperwork in the mail the other day, but um, I was wondering if there's any way to get the associated photography that would have gone along with that paperwork. Um, which case is this? It's the Donye Jones case. Oh, um, no, we don't, we don't release photographs. Is there a legal way to get them, like uh, uh, submitted through an attorney or anything? You'd have to get a subpoena. To start wrapping our heads around the facts regarding the manner in which Donye died, we were going to need to see the reports, both from the medical examiner's office and the police department. Missouri has on the books a sunshine law, which is like their version of the Freedom of Information Act. Via this law, we were able to get a copy of the medical examiner's report pretty soon after it was released. The first thing to understand about the medical examiner's report is that it's built of two primary sections. The first is a scene report, written by a medical legal investigator sent out to the scene of a death by the medical examiner's office, who in this case was a man named Michael Tarticcio. 
His job is to examine the scene, take the temperature of the body, speak to the family members, and to take detailed notes on everything. The pathologist, in this case a man named Dr. Gershom Norfleet, will examine the body. And ultimately, it is he who will draft the second part of the report. After that, the report is reviewed in whole and signed off on by the chief medical examiner, Dr. Mary Case. Upon reading the report, Melissa and her family were immediately put off by what they saw as various small errors. I'm John. Oh, my name is Gloria. Hi, Gloria. Nice Hi. to meet you. Ray. Ray? John Ray. Yep. yep. Okay, my name is Gloria. I'm uh, Melissa's mom. Oh, I'm wonderful. I'm Johnny's grandma. Grandma, okay, great. Well, well, nice to meet you. Nice yeah. to meet you all. We went to Melissa's house on a rainy spring day and sat down to talk with her family to go over the report so they could point out to us what they saw as its flaws. In the living room of their home were Melissa, her husband Derek, her brother Daniel, her sister Kim, her mother Gloria, her daughter Melicia, and Melicia's young son Messiah. One of the irregularities in the medical examiner's report that jumps out at Melissa right away concerns Danye's height. They said that also that... He was 5'7". The medical examiner right. says he's 5'7". Do you still have his driver's license? Yes. His wallet? And what's it say on his driver's license? I think it was 6'1". 6'1". Okay. Yeah. His dad is 6'5". And my, my, my side of family is tall. My husband is 5'7". And compared to my son, my husband actually has to look up. This claim that Danye was 5'7", was in the first section of the report written by the scene investigator. The second section of the report, written by the pathologist, states that he was 70 inches tall, or 5 foot 10. Danye's state ID says that he was 6 foot even. The report also claims that Danye weighed about 150 pounds, which Danye's family says was too light. His state ID, which was issued earlier in the year of his death, says he weighed 160 pounds. While his weight may have fluctuated, his height could not. Another error in the scene investigator's report concerns who saw Danye last. The report says Melissa saw him last. They also said that I had the last time I saw him was we walked past each other in the backyard. That's a flat out lie. Because that wasn't you. You did not witness that. According to his family, the last person in the house to see Danye was his uncle Daniel, who was sitting at the kitchen table having a snack. So, what was the, the last point the night before that you saw uh, Danye? I saw him leave out the. Leave, leave out the door last the the night because I was sitting in the kitchen. Do you know about what time that was? About nine o'clock. Okay. And then he and he left, left, got in his he car left. and drove off, or no, nah, or... no, nah. he, he didn't leave. He didn't leave in the car. That was the thing as well. His car was down okay. the whole week. His car was down. According to Danye's stepfather Derek, he and Danye had been watching the Boston Celtics game that evening. I leave every night between nine fifteen and nine thirty to go to work. Uh, so we were downstairs watching basketball. And my alarm went off for me to get ready to go to work. I told him, hey, man, make sure you, you know, keep me posted on this game. You know what I'm saying? I believe it was a Boston Celtics game because that's his team. We asked Derek what Danye's mood was like during that time when they were watching the game. Oh, man, we was down the top. We, we, we watched the games. You know where our brothers is. You know, we watching games. And the game was good. We was like, you know, it was all in this game, you know. And uh, it was just normal, you know, talking shit. And game. he was in a real good mood. That's why I was like. You know, what the hell could have happened between last night and this morning? Checking the NBA history, we found that the Boston Celtics played the Philadelphia 76ers on the night in question, October 16th, 2018. Boston won the game 105-87. to The game was in Boston and started at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, so 7 p.m. in St. Louis. We found stories announcing Boston's victory at 9.11 p.m., which pretty much checks out with Derek's timeline. If he usually left for work around 9.15 and had an alarm set to remind him to get ready, perhaps he actually said goodbye to Danye in the basement where they were watching the game 10 to 15 minutes before the game was over, at around 9 o'clock. Then, not too long after that, Danye headed upstairs with his backpack and passed his Uncle Daniel in the kitchen as he headed out of the house through the back door. The report also states that Derek was the one who discovered Danye hanging from the tree when, in fact, it was Melissa as we established in episode one. And though the family never complained about it, we noticed the report also named Danye's sister as Mamisha, when her name is actually Malisha. 
she is mentioned because she received a text message from Donye at 9.35 p.m. that simply said, Sorry, sis. Malisha replied to this message with, Love you. The report seems to lean into this text as if it's a final goodbye message. What we first wondered was if there wasn't some other explanation for the text because Malisha didn't respond to Donye's I'm sorry with for what like one might expect if Donye's message had been totally out of the blue or without context. So we asked Malisha about it. Can I ask, so what, what's the story with the 930 uh, text, the uh, I'm sorry? I had came here right before that message. Went, I went downstairs, took my side downstairs, he could see my side. He was like, oh, he, he walking so good and stuff. We, we talked for a second and he was just like this. Something was not right. Like he was texting somebody, I don't know, like something, I don't know. Like something was off with him. Are you saying the text felt like it? Not was the meant text. For the text. Else? I thought he was just saying oh. sorry, sis, maybe because he wasn't really interacting with me. I said, oh, I love you, bro. Did he said anything similar to Javon? No, no. Because it's not. So it's not like he was sending everybody right. goodbye no. texts. No, so, you know. And, and this and, and this, somebody this, probably like, they, oh, if the sister so, might say something that, oh, he texted her tonight, she's gonna say something, he's gonna close the case. So on October sixteenth. Danye's last full day alive, his sister had come over with her toddler son. Danye wasn't super attentive to either of them, which Melissa then kind of got on Danye about after the fact. And both of them, Melisha and Melissa, believed that his 9.35 p.m. apology text was for that inattention. We should take a minute to focus on a couple of things. First, we can't gloss over what Melisha said, that something wasn't right about Danye, that something with him felt off. This is important to keep in the back of our minds going forward. Also, that he was distracted, texting somebody. The second thing to note is the timeline. Derek said he was watching a basketball game with Danye until about 9 p.m., when Derek had to head off to work. At 9.35 p.m., Danye texts his sister, Sorry, sis. If this text represents a final goodbye message to Malicia, as the county seems to be interpreting it, that means that by this time, Danye has made his final decision to die by suicide. This is a bit strange considering what he did next. He left out with his bag, like mm -hmm. his overnight bag. And that, that's not a bag that he normally has, because he never leaves out overnight. This is Danye's uncle Daniel again. We had to check the bag and see what was in the bag, because that's not something he normally does. What was in it? It was two toothbrush, deodorant, and stuff like that. Like, over, like you, if you was going overnight, and you know you're going to be overnight. Danye is seemingly doing something he doesn't usually do, going out to stay the night somewhere. And for this overnight, he wanted clean clothes. And apparently, earlier in the day, he had asked Melissa to do some laundry for him. He was downstairs doing his studying. And then that's when he said, Ma, can you wash my clothes? This was maybe what? 8 p.m. or something? Or? No, no, that, that was earlier that day, probably around 5, 5 p.m. 5 p.m. Right. Like he was in a rush to go. So earlier in the evening, Danye wants his clothes washed, specifically things like underwear, according to Melissa. And he packs some of these clean clothes into a backpack with his toothbrush and deodorant to head off at roughly 9.30 p.m. Where was he going? Who was he planning to see? His car wasn't running all week, according to his family, so he would have needed to have been picked up by someone. Aside from the text to his sister, the medical examiner's report uses three primary things to bolster the idea that Danye died by suicide. These are statements the family supposedly gave to the on-site investigator for the county medical examiner's office, Michael Tarticcio. He writes in his report, Prior to scene departure, I made contact with multiple family members in the living room of the residence. The timeline of events was confirmed, and additional history of the decedent was obtained. It was reported the decedent had stated several times over the years that he felt depressed, although he was never clinically diagnosed with depression. We thought it was pertinent to know who in the family had told this to the medical investigator. Who provided the information that he had been depressed sometimes but hadn't been diagnosed? There's nobody from this camp. Know. None, no. So none of the three of you... That's why they said family members, because it wasn't here. It was a family member said. 
He asked, what he did, he asked us, he said, had he been depressed? And we said, no, not unusually. Like we, if we're upset about something, you know that we're upset. But no, he had just started his business and he was excited about his business. That's why it didn't make sense. You didn't even say anything that might lead them to infer. Like they, they go, uh. Well, was he ever depressed? And somebody, you might say, well, everyone gets depressed once in a while. Nothing like that at all. It's, it's like those questions where, depending on where, you, where, where how you want to take it, it's, it's so general and open Sorry. that anybody on the planet that's to have lived on the earth. It's an open question. Yeah. Have you ever been depressed? <laughs> yeah, I've been depressed. I was about 17 years old, but that just put, yes, he was depressed. The report continues. Additionally, the decedent recently started a real estate business, which did not succeed. Who among the three of you mentioned his real his real estate business and it not going well? It no failing? One. Nobody. No one. They didn't come from this camp. Nobody. No one. Like we did you guys even anyone even talk about his business at all? Yes. Yeah. Like okay. We did. Okay. Well, we said it was doing well. What's the, and that's why again I said that's why this makes no sense to me. He was so excited about his business. So just excited. the other night he right. was just writing notes. The report goes on, and he was dealing with rumors of him being a homosexual. Family stated all these things were weighing heavily on Jones's mind. Uh, homosexuality never came up at all in any now, of the interviews? No. Danye was trying to find out who was spreading the rumor about him being gay. And so Danye asked me, he said, Ma, did you hear, did anybody come to you and say any kind of mess about me being gay? And I said, no. I said, and if they had, I would tell you. I would ask you about it because I ain't got no problem with it. He said, well, let me tell you this. I love my black queens. That was his Quote. Well, I, I know we was over my house. He asked me, he said, Grandma, have you been hearing any, anything about me? And I said, no, I haven't heard anything. What would I hear? You know? So he was at least aware that there yeah. might be a rumor. Yeah. yeah. So he was trying to find out who's And he was trying to find rumors. out who's starting it. Yeah, right. because Di- one thing about my son is that he going to check you. He'll check you. You know, especially something like that, you know. According to the medical examiner's report, the family members present the morning of Danye's death were the only people the on-site investigator, Michael Tarticcio, spoke with. Tarticcio's report never quotes any specific family member or associates them with particular claims. We asked the medical examiner's office for an interview with Tarticcio, but they declined. We asked for his notes, but were told that the notes were destroyed when he wrote the final report. Clearly, the things mentioned have a basis in reality. Danye did have a new real estate business, and there was a rumor circulating that he was gay. So someone in that house must have said something to that effect for Tarticcio to be able to write about it. What is harder to tease out is the context in which these statements were made and to what level the issues behind them were actually affecting Danye psychologically and emotionally. If his family was asked, was Danye ever depressed? And someone gave a half-hearted answer like, well, I guess he was down from time to time, but who isn't? Could that get reported as the decedent has stated several times over the years that he felt depressed? What we have to remember is that when the family members are being interviewed, they are in shock. They are having one of the worst days of their lives. And they are only ever being asked if they can think of reasons why Danye would want to die, never if there was any reason he wouldn't. And maybe this is a nitpick And perhaps it's reasonable that investigators don't want to plant seeds of doubt in the minds of family members in these situations. But wouldn't people trying to determine a cause of death want to know what good things were going on in Danye's life? Wouldn't they want to know that he was reconnecting with an ex-girlfriend and making plans to go out with her soon? Because he was. The day before Danye died, he was texting with his ex-girlfriend, Loretha. There was also talk of going out together that weekend. He was seeing a, a newer, a newer woman, right? No, she wasn't new. She was a his ex. Okay. But they were talking about um, what he was doing, what they were doing for his birthday and everything. Were you under the impression he like since he wants his like underwear and his clothes washed that maybe he's going out to hang out with her? Right. Well, that's what I thought that you know maybe he had somewhere to go because from what he had in his overnight bag was stuff that he would use if he was going to spend a night somewhere, you know, like somewhere high, you know. While we were in the room with all of Danye's family, 
we wanted to ask about one quick thing. Back in episode one, Melissa told us over the phone that the lead detective in the case, Timothy Anderer, had given her family a business card before he left their home on the morning of Danye's death, but that it wasn't his business card. She said it was for the St. Louis Airport Police. We asked if she still had it, and she did. She brought it out of a folder of paperwork and handed it to us. Sure enough, it has a large logo for the St. Louis Airport Police on it, and the name Sergeant Leslie F. Williams in black print. We asked if they called the number on the card, and if so, what happened? I called him. I talked to him. He finally called me back. And when I was running down to him, I said, you know, we were trying to find out, you know, what, what, what do we have to do to get the sheet back? And he was like, you know, sheet, what, what are you talking about? So right then I knew, and plus it was, a, it was a black guy. So I knew right then I wasn't talking to the guy that gave me the card. He was just completely, you know, unknown of any of this. Why Detective Anderer would even have this business card in his pocket is a mystery. But combining this incident with what Melissa describes as his disrespectful, boisterous laughter, and now lumping it in with the various details that the medical examiner's report got wrong, even if some of them are trivial, like who saw Danye last, who discovered him, or his sister's name, is it not understandable why Danye's family would see all of this inattention to detail, along with the misconstrued context of their statements, and then presume that if investigators got the little things wrong, they probably got the conclusion wrong too? Before leaving, Melissa wanted us to be aware that strange cars had been parking outside of her house for a long time, but with increasing frequency leading up to Danye's death. And sometimes, it appeared as though the occupants of these cars were police. Because like we said, people were sitting outside of the house. Police came, at least five of them, and stood outside the house in front of our house and just looked our di- just staring at our direction. And that scared us, you know. And that was how soon before? That was probably like two weeks prior. Yeah, and that, that one hadn't happened before. You've been seeing cars for like a year, but you hadn't seen guys get out. And Is it the day now, I was on uh, FaceTime with you? And I was like, okay, maybe she tripping. And you put the phone out the window. No, that was just one time that somebody was sitting outside. It was like they started coming around constantly, constantly. When people got out and like walked and you saw They had them. police on their shirt. In episode one, Sergeant McGuire told us that Melissa never mentioned strange cars to detectives who were investigating Danye's death. But we wouldn't know if that was true until Detective Anderer filed his final report. In the meantime, we wanted the St. Louis County Medical Examiner's Office's positions on the details of the case. We had the report in hand, but hadn't yet seen any of the photographs they had of Danye's body. We had been told that we would need a subpoena to get them, But after emailing their office the relevant text from Missouri Sunshine Law, we were able to convince them to send us the photographs, which would arrive on a CD. In the meantime, we called Dr. Gershom Norfleet, the pathologist who examined Danye's body, which never actually had an autopsy done on it. You know, this is something I always want people to understand, that autopsy is not like the all in the all of all cases. Autopsies are helpful to kind of like rule out traumatic circumstances and things like that, but at the okay. same time, investigation of speaking with family, speaking with uh, the police, anyone else who's also been to the scene, and I have an investigator that goes out there as well, we we'll take all of that information into account when we come up with our determination for uh, causes of death. We wanted to know how he would distinguish between a hanging death that was a suicide versus a hanging death that was a murder. Let's just say they're so far off the ground where they couldn't have done that themselves. So you take, you cut them down, you get the rope, you do DNA, you realize that none of the DNA from the rope is the individual who's hanging. There's another profile that's found on it. Uh, there's no way that the individual could have gotten into the tree where they're positioned to hang themselves. There's no chair by them. Down in the dirt, there's signs of a struggle. You see multiple footprints. Uh, there's trauma to the body. You see scratches. You see abrasions. So if you see something like that, but if you're missing all of those things and you've talked to everybody and say that you talked to people initially and then, you know, two weeks later the story changes, well, that's, uh, I don't have any control over that. 
At Melissa's press conference, she did say that Danye had a bruise on his face and indentations on his wrists. We asked if Norfleet saw any such markings on Danye's body. There's nothing on the body, in my personal opinion, that shows any type of struggle or there's no bruising, regardless of what anyone else says. Then, out of nowhere, he offered up something we hadn't heard yet from anyone. The, the actual ligature, the bed sheet um, that was, you know, uh, used was, was sent down to our lab and they did DNA on it looking for profiles. And the particular significant portions of the, the ligature of where it's going to be tied to, the profiles is pretty much predominantly coming back to Donye Jones. So he has physically touched this particular area of where it's tied to the tree. The profiles are matching. This conversation happened on March 18th of 2019, five months after Danye's death. The medical examiner's report never mentions DNA in it, not even once. And it turns out that's because the DNA swabbing and testing was done by the St. Louis County Police Department's crime lab. Norfleet must have heard about this testing through the grapevine. At this point in time, Melissa and the rest of Danye's family have not been made aware that any DNA testing of the bedsheet had been done by anybody. This was partially because the police department hadn't issued their final report on Danye's death yet. In January of 2019, Sergeant Sean McGuire told us that it would likely take a few more weeks to complete that report. But ultimately, the report wouldn't be finalized until July of 2019, fully nine months after Danye's death. And it was the police report that would mention the DNA. And we will come back to that in a future episode. But for now, understand that this DNA information was all inside baseball amongst detectives and some staff at the medical examiner's office. So at the time of this conversation with Norfleet, it was news to us. But the real kicker was what he would tell us next. And I take no secondary DNA at all on the... um, There there is another one, but I'm not exactly sure. uh, It's a minor component. I don't know who it matches to. It's just a male, from what I know. We were kind of astounded to find out that the county police had found a second set of male DNA on the bedsheet that Danye was found hanging from. And nobody seemed to think that this was very important. What work was done on determining the origins of the second set of DNA on the, uh, on the sheet? Or was that, that I can't tell you. That's, that has yeah. nothing to do with me. So that, oh, that would be a, that'd be a police investigation. Yes, that has, that, has nothing, that's, that has nothing to do with me. You've learned enough that you knew it was a male, correct? Was that just that it's, there's a Y haplo group on the... I don't know exactly what testing was done to be able to determine that. But there, I, I do know there were two profiles. But there's a major one, and then there's a minor one. And it appears to yeah. be some unknown male, and no one knows who that is. But gotcha. that's... That, it, to, to me, it's here, neither there. Because, like I said, it's a it's a bed sheet. Who, if if DNA is DNA too, so so just let's just say it was briefly in his house for a period of time. It was laying on something. There's other males that live in that house. Um, so you could start swabbing everybody from Timbuktu to try to figure out who it is, but I I, I don't know how far that went. Timbuktu? How about just swab the other two males in the house? Danye's uncle Daniel and his stepfather Derek. I mean, that would be a good place to start, right? We couldn't help but find this shocking. The police found a second set of male DNA on the sheet, and everyone, including the pathologist, just presumed it was from another male in the house, without ever attempting to eliminate them by requesting they give a DNA sample. We also couldn't help but notice that Melissa's DNA wasn't on the sheet. She was the one who did the house's laundry. So presumably, if that was her sheet, and she was the one who pulled it from the dryer, folded it, and placed it in a closet, that her DNA would have been found on it. There are other important details here that we need to stop and focus on. For one, Dr. Norfleet said that Danye's DNA was on the portion of the bed sheet that was tied around the tree. He has no way of knowing that, because the crime lab would have no way of knowing where that portion of the sheet was, as the sheet was untied from the tree. He actually acknowledges this when we ask him about the knot itself and whether or not it was a sliding or a fixed knot. 
I don't know about specifically the part in the tree because I didn't undo that portion. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know anything about that. Um, in terms of the knot, you would have to ask whoever untied it off the tree branch. And I know my investigator didn't do it. That's probably something St. Louis County did. So you would have to ask them. The truth is, Norfleet's investigator, Michael Tarticcio, did take the sheet out of the tree. He says so in his report, stating, I was able to untie one end of the bedsheet and place it in the body bag with the decedent. So the crime lab couldn't possibly have known where the sheet was tied into the tree to swab for DNA. And what's worse, the sheet was placed in the body bag with Danye's body. The sheet was not treated as potential evidence and secured in a separate bag, but traveled to the morgue against Danye's body, possibly contaminating the entirety of the sheet with Danye's DNA. So even if the crime lab did know where to swab, to find out who tied the sheet to the tree, Danye's DNA would potentially have been all over it. And though we wouldn't know this until the police report finally did get released later in the year, the section that speaks on this DNA evidence states that the knot area of the sheet was swabbed. So this must be a reference to the only knot left, which was the lower knot that would have been behind Danye's head. We tried contacting the crime lab and the particular technician who did the swabbing of the sheet to get specifics on how much was swabbed and where. You have reached the St. Louis County Police Crime Laboratory. Crime Lab, this is Jesse. You're exactly the person I'm, uh, I'm, I'm looking for. My name is John Duffy. I'm a journalist working on a story, and you did some evidence swabs on a, a particular piece of evidence from a crime a couple of years ago. And I just had like a quick question about methodologies. And the, what is the what is the case? So the case was uh, a young man who ha- was found hanged, and it was uh, eventually found to be a suicide. You know, when I look through the case report, it just it has your name as the person who swabbed it. And the write-up says, swabbed on the knot portion. And I just was trying to get, like, a technical understanding of was that swab done on, like, the knot knot, where the knot was tied, or was it the loop around his neck, or was it all of it? Okay, well, I will discuss this with my supervisors. Okay, I don't, I don't know what we are at liberty to discuss. So thank you for your inquiry, and we will give you a response. And then we never heard from them again, despite our repeated attempts to reach out. We at least hoped Dr. Norfleet could tell us if the sheet had any damage to it, as if perhaps Danye had been tied into it and then lifted off the ground by someone else pulling the sheet over a rough tree branch. I never, I never really looked at the sheet that hard what's the tipping point in this case it's not so much a a tipping point it's the it's the totality of everything that's being said initially what we have and then from the investigation from st louis county police department there hasn't been anything that has come forward to suggest there's something anyone other than himself did this to himself but the determination uh, is colored to some extent by the investigator's interview with the family, uh, the statements about depression, the circumstances mm-hmm. around the text message. This all helps form the, the picture. Opinion. Yes, the yeah. opinion. Yes, it does. Norfleet took very seriously the family statements that his scene investigator delivered to him that morning. He took seriously Danye's DNA that he thought was on the portion of the sheet tied into the tree. He took seriously the idea that Detective Anderer, whom he likely didn't know had been sued for using excessive force against black protesters, had done a thorough job of investigating the circumstances of Danye's death. And there was one other fact he wanted to drive home to us, something he thought held a lot of weight, so much so that he wanted to read it to us directly from his site investigator's section of the report. I'm going to read you the whole paragraph but then I'm going to reiterate specifically to a sentence that we have in here. So anyway, Jones was last seen alive by Melissa. False. He's last seen by his uncle. As he walked into the backyard carrying a backpack. Melissa did not find this unusual and carried on with her night as usual. It was later discovered Jones sent Mamisha, that's a sister. False, but trivial. A text message at approximately 2130 that stated, I'm sorry. Mamisha reportedly replied to that text message by saying, I love you. There was no further communication after that point with the decedent. 
Dr. Norfleet was interpreting the I'm sorry text Danye sent out as a goodbye message. It's all speculation, but if someone texts things like, what, what does that mean to you? Is there, there should be a concern there that his emotional state is not normal. He went on to admit that he didn't actually know the context of that message, but it was clear what he thought it meant and how it framed his view of Danye's death. And Mamisha, I bet most people in the media have never talked to her. No one's ever questioned her about this, this, this dialogue. Ironically, he also pointed out that he hadn't seen anyone in the media mentioning this text or asking Malisha about it, but we did. And Malisha is convinced that the I'm sorry text had to do with Danye not giving her much time or attention when she visited with her son earlier that day. Part of the credibility granted to the medical examiner's system is that it's not just a site investigator and a pathologist determining a cause and manner of death, but a third party, the chief medical examiner, must review the case materials and sign off on them. For St. Louis County, that person is Dr. Mary Case. For us, there was a slight concern that maybe an entire investigation could go undone because one person's presumption at the scene of a death would affect the next person's, which would affect the next person's, which would sort of render certain checks and balances meaningless. When you say presuming, uh, when somebody has, when there is a lethal mechanism that someone uses and, and it, it works, like holding a gun to your head or putting a rope around your neck, that, that is, you know, rather overwhelming. Now, if there is evidence to the contrary, certainly that would be further investigated. But... This office has never been presented with any other information. For someone to say, well, that sheet didn't come from my house, that's not going to dissuade me from the fact that that was a suicide. One of the things that we found interesting was that Dr. Case hadn't heard about the DNA swabs taken from the bedsheet. Were there swabs or any samples taken in this case? Uh, I don't know, but I would I, I would very much doubt it. If I can talk to you about that real quick, when they say that sheet didn't come from their house, we have found in the course of our investigation that there was DNA pulled off of that sheet, and it was Donye's DNA, and then an un- unidentified male's DNA. But to me, the one thing that sort of stands out is that not only does Melissa claim that they just don't have extra sheets in the house, they just have enough for the beds, but her DNA is not on that sheet. They didn't find any unidentified female DNA, and she's the one who does all the house's laundry. It's pretty hard to prove a negative, like, I didn't own that. And they weren't ever told that DNA was tested on it. It was something that we found out and then that we told them. It never made the medical examiner's report. You weren't even aware of it. Well, no, we never get... We never get any of that. But wouldn't you know that it We don't happened? get, we never get DNA results back. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't interact with our decisions. That's not how we base our decisions. Let's pause here for a second. This is bizarre. The medical examiner's office is responsible for determining cause and manner of death. A second or third set of DNA on a lethal instrument could in fact be the evidence they need to move a determination from suicide to homicide, or at least to undetermined. It could be the evidence they claim they are yet to see. Couldn't it? So why such little interest? Dr. Norfleet had told us that, with a lack of trauma to the body, his determination was made largely around the statements given to the medical investigator. Of course, Danye's family says they didn't say the things that are in the report, or at least didn't say them in the way that they are reported. So we mentioned this to Dr. Case. My question would be about the investigative method to get those statements because the family agrees that they talked about those things, but they don't agree that they stated them in a way that they were weighing on him to an extent where it seemed like they were bothering him that much. When the investigator is speaking with the family members, they're, you know, they're kind of asking about the state of mind and, you know, what's going on. And so those things were brought out. Obviously, this is not a psychiatric interview, but those were statements that were made and they're noted. It doesn't mean that that is the motivation. I guess the problem for them is that other things that are sort of positive going on in the person's life 
don't get noted. And then when the police refer to this, so like when the St. Louis County Police make statements about the case, they refer to the medical examiner's report. So they go, well, yeah, I mean, if you look at it, he was depressed. I would say this, none of that made this a suicide. What made this a suicide was there is a man hanging in his backyard from a tree. Now, if you have evidence that somebody did that, I will be happy to change that. Back in episode one, Sergeant Sean McGuire defended the police department's assessment that Danye died by suicide by referencing the medical examiner's report. And now, the pathologist and the chief medical examiner say that they based their work on the evidence brought to them by the police. I guess it's just for, it, it, it would seem to be is that it can kind of become sort of a self-reinforcing circle where if like police start presuming that there's no need to look for further evidence and then you're not, that means you're not getting any further evidence. And I will say this, that, that we, do you know how many suicides we have a year? I'm sure it's a lot. We looked it up. According to county police data, it's about 60. We have, we have a lot of them. And when we have them, there is a certain amount of investigation. But it is not much more than this. There's just one more thing. And maybe this is minor, but it bugged us. Danye's uncle Daniel had taken photos of Danye hanging from the tree because Danye's pants were down around his ankles. And this seems strange to him. Dr. Case touched on this point when she was reviewing the report over the phone with us. And in the photo, apparently, the pants were around the ankles. But I would say that if you're hanging up in a tree and your pants are sagging anyway, they may well fall down because they're, if you don't hold them up, they're going to fall down. This assumption that Danye's pants were sagging, that he would ordinarily need to hold them up, seems a bit racist. I'm not trying to smear Dr. Case, but she does seem to be just presuming that because Danye is black, he sags his pants and that this must be the reason they were found around his ankles. When I explain that this wasn't the case, she just sort of moves on. Well, they were, um, they were actually like a, elastic waistband pants that had a drawstring, and they found it okay. weird because they, they appeared to have been rolled at least like two or three times at the waist, which is what they found to be strange. Let me see what else is here. Um... So what does all this mean, this he said, she said, about Danye's life and mental state between his family and the medical examiner staff? This text message that might be a final goodbye or might just be a casual apology for an action already taken. This second set of male DNA that was found on the bedsheet Danye was hanged with that could be from his uncle or his stepfather or from a potential conspirator in a murder made to look like a suicide. We are reminded of the Texas sharpshooter fallacy, which is the idea that people only look at pieces of evidence that confirm their hypothesis. It's based on an old joke about a Texan who shoots several times at the side of a barn and then paints a bullseye around the bullet holes, claims to be a sharpshooter. Are Melissa and the rest of Danye's family only seeing what they want to see? When the CD full of photographs from the medical examiner's office showed up, we looked them over again and again. No, we couldn't see any bruises on Danye's body, not on his face or on his wrists. But we also saw the way the sheet was tied into the tree. And yes, it did look like a strange, unintuitive figure eight system. Was the medical examiner's office negligent for having untied it and tossed it in the body bag alongside Danye's body? Did this demonstrate that from the get-go, No one was taking the possibility of homicide seriously. What about the county police, tasked with investigating the scene and circumstances of Danye's death? Did they bring all of their resources and efforts to bear? If not, why not? We're not naive. Of course, these people are busy. They have a lot of cases. And they're professionals, doctors. But it's hard not to think that maybe some cases should have a higher threshold of evidence than others. Maybe when we remember to apply social and historical context and see that a death greatly mirrors a racist lynching, we should expect local governments to look a little harder, to scratch a little deeper, just in case. 
Why wouldn't they? That's next time on After the Uprising. After the Uprising is directed, produced, investigated, written, and reported by myself, Raina Vyshelsky, and John Duffy. John Duffy was also the editor. Dave Cassidy was producer. Sound engineering, design, and mix by Josh Condon. Executive producers were Matt McDonough and Tina Xeros for Now This, Brett Kushner for Group 9 Media, and Jess Borave was executive in charge of production. Jonathan Hartwig and Bradley Rayford were consulting producers. Eliza Craig was assistant producer and did additional reporting. Mallory Kenoy was a writer's assistant. Kristen McVicker and Taya Wilson were production assistants. And Haley Klezmer was a post-production assistant. Fact-checking by Allison Humes. Theme song and other music by Zachary Walter. Legal by Keith Sklar and Peter Yazzie. Special thanks to Ann Frado, Danny Gonzalez, Barbara Koppel, Alex Lester, Beth Ann Macaluso, Emily Marinoff, Ruth Vaca, and the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. After the Uprising is a production of Double Asterisk, iHeartMedia, and Now This in association with True Stories. You can find us on Twitter and Facebook. If you have useful information about the death of Donye Jones or anything we've covered, please leave a message on our tip line at 347-674-7401.